We want to briefly say hello to everyone here. We want to give everybody a chance to say who they are so that everyone else can know who is here. John, you want to start? Oh, right, you start with me, Elaine Chapnick, co-president of the summit. I'm going to introduce Mary Lee. Mary Lee Barrage, co-president of the summit. Okay, John. Welcome. John Gitlitz, chairman of the Hispanic Resource Center and summit board. Um, Heidi Sickles, I'm president of the Brighton Board of Education and summit board. Bob Hyde, summit board. Uh, John Bradley, uh, uh, I'm a volunteer at home on the town. Carving Heiser, my mother and husband are veterans, and my mother-in-law is surviving spouse. Corwin, Burke Corwin's wife, he's head of the vehicle. That makes you famous. <laughs> 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 and I'm on, on, on the Kemper board, Jan North Jan North That means uh, veterans who have serious illnesses, what kind of medical care can you provide for them? Uh, on Monday, uh, March 21st, the Affordable Care Act after one year, so this has to do with health care reform and what it means for everyday New Yorkers. So I'll, I'll leave these on the back uh, chair. Thank you. Any new sleepers, some of board and at home on the side. Uh, Janet Siegel of uh, Four Winds Hospital. I'll just take one second also to tell you that we are doing a group with the Red Cross in White Plains for veterans and their families. Darren Winston, I'm the outreach coordinator with VA Hospital. One thing I'd want to just add for behind you. Behind you. Yeah, we get behind. I just want you all to know there are community booklets here that the summit puts out. Anybody that hasn't uh, gotten one before and feels that they can make use of it for all community services, this is something that we put out very proudly, and we have plenty of copies. So feel free. I'm sorry to interrupt. You. Uh, I'm Carolyn Pomerantz, um, a summit board member, League of Women Voters board member. I just want to mention uh, the League is having on uh, March 25th, Friday, um, a luncheon at the Devonport Club featuring uh, former Chief Justice Judith Kay. So we welcome you all to come. Um, also, um, I'm besides the summit board, I'm, I'm moderating today, and I'm vice president of um, the Library Board of Trustees, Mimaric Library. Iris Free Hope Community Services, and I'd like to tell you, take a few moments to tell you about. We're having our 25th anniversary on March 31st. I have some invitations I'd like to bring back. Okay. <laughs> Selwyn Free. This is National Health Program and Physicians for Social Responsibility and uh, Husband of Iris. <laughs> okay, welcome everyone. Um, today is March 15th, also known as the Ides of March. Beware. Most famously, this is the day Julius Caesar was killed in 44 BC after ignoring warnings of danger and to Brute. But the Ides of March actually was a festive day dedicated to the Roman god Mars, and a military parade was usually held in celebration. Today, we recognize our military servicemen and women with this distinguished panel. They will address issues relating to our community's hidden heroes, our military veterans, and how well are we providing for our returning veterans. In preparation for this meeting, I had asked what I thought would be a simple question. How many veterans are there in our tri-municipal area? 
Unfortunately, after being subjected to endless forwarded calls from the Department of Defense to the Veterans Affairs Department, I don't know what other departments I was, I never got a straight answer. Someone was supposed to call back and never did. No surprise, I guess. Um, all I've heard is that our area has a lot fewer than other regions like the Midwest and the South. Um, but maybe one of our panelists can shed a little light on this, I'm not sure. Um, I had contacted um, Nita Lowy's district director, I don't know if he's here yet, but he was planning to come. Um, and he was going to explain that he is equally frustrated with this, but, uh, but to, you know, what can we do? I guess uh, we'll have to, they'll have to remain hidden, and hopefully um, presentations like today can help bring out and shed some light on our hidden heroes. Um, one place returning veterans can turn to for services is the VA or the Veterans Administration Hospitals. Um, I was told that our Hudson Valley region has a large two-campus hospital system with campuses in Montrose and Castle Point and an additional seven community regional clinics serving 160,000 veterans in our region. Our first speaker is the district director of this region, the VA Hudson Valley Healthcare System, Gerald F. Culleton. Before coming to Hudson Valley um, to be the director, Mr. Culleton was the director of the Northport VA Medical Center and previously served as deputy regional network director for the VA New York, New Jersey Veterans Healthcare Network. Mr. Culleton joined the VA in 1989 as Public Affairs Communications Director, then held posts as Special Assistant to the Medical Center Director, uh, Network Communications Officer, Officer, and Chief Operations Officer. Prior to joining the VA, he was an award-winning journalist and news director in the New York metropolitan region. He holds a master's degree in Public Administration Healthcare and is a graduate of Government and VA Leadership Training Programs. He has completed two intensive re residential certificate programs at Harvard University. Mr. Culleton is a past board chair of the American Cancer Society Division and is a senior lecturer in the Masters of Public Health Administration program. He's a member of the New York City Mayor's Commission on Homeless Veterans, and he recently received recognition as Federal Executive of the Year from the Federal Executive Board. He is most proud, he tells me, however, of the awards and recognitions he has received from veteran service organizations nationally and throughout the region. We are pleased and honored to welcome VA District Director Gerald Cull Culleton. Good morning, good morning. I'll move up here a little bit. Um, I want to thank you so much for, for inviting us. I, I have the great privilege of, of running two tremendous VA hospitals at Montrose, uh, just south of Peekskill, and at Castle Point, which is in Dutchess County. I would be remiss to not recognize that we also have another VA hospital in the region, the Bronx VA Hospital, which is run by uh, my dear friend Marianne Musamichi, uh, and they do a great job and handle some of our more intricate, uh, high-end kind of clinical things that, that we don't do in Hudson Valley. Um, so we do have, one of the questions that you had here um, was how are we taking care of our nation's veterans? Uh, and you know, I, I know Vito Pinto from Westchester County and, and all of the other uh, organizations that deal with veterans, uh, and certainly our veteran service organizations, our American Legion, and VFW, and AMVETS, and Prisoners of War organizations, and all these organizations. I think. We do a remarkable job taking care of veterans in the region. But the question about how many veterans, uh, there are about 80,000 veterans in Westchester County, uh, which, is, which is pretty good. Uh, it used to be about 10%, so it's not 10% anymore. It's probably about 8% of the population. You are correct when you talk about the fact that there are many veterans who uh, live in other parts of the country, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, veterans who, who come back to this area who are, who are younger can't afford to live in this area anymore, so they move to less expensive regions of the country. Uh, a lot of veterans retire to other regions of the country, uh, and there are 
greater numbers of people who enter the military in other regions of the country, and there are other uh, military installation issues. So if someone gets hooked up to a certain uh, military installation or base, sometimes veterans tend to congregate in that area. So there are parts of the South and the West that have burgeoning numbers of veterans. I brought Darren Winston with me today. Darren is our new outreach coordinator for the VA Hudson Valley Healthcare System. And you say, well, why do you have an outreach coordinator if there are so many veterans? The reality of, of what's happening in, in this region is that we are losing numbers of veterans who are using the VA healthcare system. The VA healthcare system, at the local level, at the hospital level, we get, we get our budget based on the number of veterans we serve, which makes good sense. It's a good way to use your taxpayer dollars. We don't get, we don't get frivolous amounts of money for just raw numbers. The number of veterans that we serve is directly correlated to the dollars that we get to run our hospital. So if we have a declining number of veterans using our hospitals, that would equate to a declining budgetary situation for our hospitals. And so that makes it harder to keep up. So one of the things that we do is we go to everything we're invited to, like, <laughs> like this great event here. And, uh, and we try to make sure that all the veterans in our region, in our, we call it our catchment area, uh, are really aware of the services that we have. And I bring Darren with me all the time because, and we can get into this later if you want, but eligibility criteria for who can use the VA and who can't is a little complicated. Darren has all the answers. <laughs> so if you have an uncle or a sister or a brother who you're wondering can he use the VA or can she use the VA, uh, he can answer that question for you after this meeting. Uh, he also gave you out a lot of materials. I mean, why are we giving out those materials? Because we need to have veterans from Westchester County using our VA hospitals. It's really imperative that they come and be a part of us. One, is, one reason is that it does bring funding into the region by having more veterans use us. That's a good reason. The second reason is the VA in the last 10 or 12 years has transformed itself. It is a, it's a remarkably good healthcare system and, and veterans get on the whole, tremendous care within the VA healthcare system. So a veteran who is eligible should be getting some or part of his care or her care at the VA healthcare system. So that's just, that's my little commercial. And I was, I didn't come to do a commercial, but, um, but you can't stop me. <laughs> so I'll just do it. Um, are they getting the medical help they need is one of the questions that was asked. Uh, I think the veterans who come to the VA are getting the medical help that they need. I would also add, I think that they're getting the mental health care that they need. A lot of issues that we're dealing with now with our newest returning veterans are young men and women who are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. Operation New Dawn, Operation Enduring Freedom, uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, OIF, OEF, we use that term all the time. Uh, this, this group is a tough group. They're, they're your kids and your grandkids age. We have, I was in the halls of Montrose recently and there was a 21 year old girl with a baby who's one of our veterans. That's very different for us. We're used to dealing with 65 year old men in the VA healthcare system. Now we're dealing with 21 year old girls with babies uh, and their 23 year old husband uh, who have the rest of the kids in tow. So we've had to shift gears tremendously about what we do, and we've actually, we're actually talking about be, bringing a pediatrician on board, not to serve the kids, because we don't, we're, legislatively we're not allowed to do that, but because the veterans are so young that there's, there's adolescent issues that we have to deal with. Um, so you know, we're having these kinds of very interesting discussions. Uh, the younger veterans, like our colleagues who who served in Vietnam and who served in World War II, when they get out of Iraq and Afghanistan, the last thing they want to do is think about how they feel. They want to get back to work. They want to get with their girlfriend or their wife or their boyfriend. Uh, they want to go to college. They're not thinking about, my knee hurts. I'm not sleeping well. I'm drinking a little too much. Uh, they're not thinking about that. So they don't come to the VA right away. 
and, and some of them don't okay. want to come to the VA because they don't want a diagnosis that could inhibit them from getting a job as a police officer or a firefighter or some other municipal job. They don't want that diagnosis. So we have these veterans out there who have this tremendous need, and the question is, are we taking care of the health care needs of our veterans? We're here ready to do that. What I need is, you know, it takes a village. I need the community to help me get these young men and women into the system. Well, and someone said, oh, don't, you don't have to, Darren, you don't have to hand out all these things because it's, you know, we, we don't have a lot of veterans, just give it to the veterans. Absolutely wrong. It's the wives and the mothers and the girlfriends that get the veterans in. They're the ones that say to the young man, something's wrong with you, kid. I'm bringing you to the VA hospital because the young man's not coming on his own. Uh, so what I'm going to ask you all to do is take these packages, and if you want more, Darren will give them to you, and find that veteran who goes to your church or your synagogue. Find that veteran who uh, is, is in the community working at the diner, working, uh, working down by the shore, working at the Davenport, you know, bussing tables, whatever he's doing, or is in Westchester Community College or Iona or wherever they're going, and give them this and tell them to get their self, themselves over to the VA. I know I only have seven minutes. So I'll try to answer one more question. I'll seed some of my time. <laughs> Are they finding jobs? That's tough. The, the economy is tough. And, and so a lot of our younger veterans are coming back. We've had two, three actually very successful job fairs at the Hudson Valley. Big job fairs with lots of employers. And we've actually gotten a lot of veterans hired. We hire a lot of veterans within the VA healthcare system. And Vito probably can talk about this even more than I can. <coughs> the community has to be ready to employ these young men and women because if they don't, they will move out of the area. If they can't get work here, they can't afford the rent, and they're not going to live with mom and dad forever. Um, so, or maybe some of them do. But, um, but you know, they're going to move out of the area, and we don't want to lose that resource. The last thing we want to do, and I know Vito feels the same way, is lose the young men and women who served our country from our region. They are the backbone of everything that you know this area of the country has stood for from the revolution right to today. So jobs is very important. So for those of you, I think there's some prominent people in this room today. Um, you know, those of you who have connections, make sure your friends uh, who are running businesses look to hire veterans, look purposefully to hire veterans. And if you don't know where they are, just call us at the VA and we can refer them to you and Vito, Vito could do the same. All right, so I'm going to stop because I could go for the whole okay, hour. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> questions, please hold your questions to the end. Okay, well, we've heard a little bit about the federal government, I guess. Uh, how does our county, Westchester County, reach out to returning veterans? What programs are in place to make their lives easier? To answer that and much more, we have our second panelist, the director of Westchester County's Veterans Services Agency, Vito J. Pinto. Mr. Pinto has a distinguished background in education, public service, and military service. He had served eight years as a naval officer, achieving the rank of lieutenant. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sorry. He had two tours in Vietnam as a naval flight officer in the F-4 Phantom Jet, that sounds so cool, uh, attached to the VF-96 Fighter Squadron, deployed ab aboard the USS Ranger and USS Enterprise in the Tonkin, Tonkin Gulf, I can't even say it. He had numerous flying missions in both South and North Vietnam. He spent 32 years in education, in the education field, as a guidance counselor, most in his home district of Tuckahoe. And while there, coached uh, girls' sports teams and was the student government advisor. And maybe that made him a little interested in government more because um, he also served about 27 years as an elected official, which included two terms as Village of Tuckahoe trustee, three terms as an East Chester Councilman and over 12 years as a Westchester County Legislator representing <coughs> District 10. He resides in Tuckahoe with his wife and four children. Um, in addition to serving as Director of the County's Veteran Services Agency, Mr. Pinto also has a dual role as Director of Stop DWI. To sum it up, Mr. Pinto has served young and old, our schools, our country, and our government, and we are so very pleased to welcome him here today.
I, I would really want to take this opportunity to thank you and see my former colleague Judy Myers and Ms. Ezar and, and a few other people. But yeah, I'm really here today to ask for your assistance. When we talk about Westchester County, um, throughout my years of service, uh, Westchester County really does care about its veterans. Our county government does everything it can to hire returning veterans. We uh, recently, I hope last night, passed a law uh, allowing veterans uh, the financial benefit of maintaining the difference between the salary they earn if called upon to active duty and the salary they're presently earning. It's good common sense to do so. Many local corporations and community employees do the same. I say that because it maintains continuity for the family. A young man or a young woman being called to active duty must leave his or her family and her, his or her home and the difference between the salaries could be quite drastic. Uh, somebody could be a, a sergeant or a private first class and the salary they're earning as a police officer or a public works official, uh, you know, it, it's quite different. So we thank the county government for passing that last night and for showing its uh, support. We talk about 80,000 veterans in Westchester County. Uh, we don't have all of them in the system. And when I say in the system, Westchester County is blessed. We have the Westchester County Veterans Service Agency in White Plains. We also have, because Yonkers is the fourth largest city, its own Yonkers Veterans Service Agency run by Al Ramsey and Dan Morier in Yonkers. And in Mount Vernon, we have Will DeBose, who runs the Mount Vernon Veterans Service Agency. And we work well together. There's no ownership. We have to work together. And I've met Darren and, and Jerry, and we do as much as we can together, because together we can unite and, and have a one goal, one purpose. Uh, we have upcoming a Veterans Town Hall meeting. We hold two a year at the county center. I put a card on, and to save money, we printed them in black and white because we care about the tax dollars that we spend. <laughs> How's that for a pitch for the politicians? <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's going to be held on Tuesday, March 29th, and we do two sessions, one in the afternoon, uh, 3 to 5, and one from uh, in the evening from 6 to 8. Uh, we will invite as many people to participate that can share their services with those veterans who attend. Uh, Jerry always provides, Darren will be there. Uh, our thrust this year is going to try to be on female uh, military uh, service persons. I say military because people don't like to use the term veteran, especially the young people coming back from OEI and uh, OIE, uh, the uh, Operation in Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom, soon to be called Operation New Dawn because we don't know where we're going from here. The services we provide. Uh, we have qualified service counselors. We have two at Westchester. We have Mikhail Ansari and we have Dan Griffin. Both of them are uh, military veterans. Um, we have two wonderful people who assist us in community outreach, Tasha Duncan, who does a lot of our programming and computer work. And we also work with the veterans on their needs. Now, their needs aren't only in health. We, we help them with their guaranteed uh, loans. We help them with jobs. We help them with their burial benefits in terms of, you know, uh, should a, a, a woman lose her husband who served in the, in, the, in the military, there are burial benefits, not nice to talk about. We want you to know that they're there. Pensions and compensation. And a lot of wives don't understand that they're eligible for aid and attendance. And when they get aid and attendance, you know, that's all money that comes back in, and it's also money that helps them with their financial situation. Presently, we're over $56 million in veterans benefits just through the VA pension system with those who come through our system in Westchester County. That's exclusive of the education benefits. A lot of young people today are taking advantage of the educational benefits. As you may or may not know, the VA expanded the length of term of uh, time for them to recoup their veterans benefits for education. We have a lot of young people going. But understand this, not everybody who serves in the military really is um, capable of going back to college just after their service. And I put it this way, on an aircraft carrier, we had young men who had GEDs or no high school diplomas. And they're pushing aircraft around, they're sleeping on the wings, uh, they're loading arm, arm, uh, armament on the planes, and they're looking for a place to go. And uh, so they may not be eligible for the four-year college, but some of them will try a certificate program at a two-year college 
for which Westchester Community College is an excellent resource. We have uh, friendly colleges in Westchester. We have Monroe College. We have Fordham University. We have Mercy College. They're all stellar in terms of providing educational counseling and educational benefits. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're there to serve you. Female veterans, they're different. And you better believe they are. And, and it's, we better understand that they need help. They're the last ones to come looking for help. They go through more trauma, perhaps, than men do on the, on the battlefront. Uh, there are cases, we just had one, who finally came out and, and, and spoke to one of our counselors, and the, the, the events that she went through, uh, finally we were able to get her into the system and get her the assistance she needed. So with that in mind, we're going to try to do as much we can uh, for female uh, returning military veterans, and uh, we'll try to provide that service which we can for all veterans in Westchester County. We hold two town meetings a, a, a year. We have Veterans Appreciation Day on the Sunday before Memorial Day at the Playland. Uh, we've expanded it. We, In the three years, we went from 400 to 700. The last year, 1,400 veterans and active duty personnel who attended that day in that program. Uh, we'll, we'll be looking for sponsors. And the last but not least, we started a favor program. FAVOR stands for, it's an acronym, Find and Assist the Veteran of Record. Actually, we took the name from Rockland County. Rockland started it some years ago, and it was Find and Assist the Veteran of Rockland. But we found that we use a, 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 a different acronym. It's, we've asked community businesses to recognize the service of those who serve them. Small discount. Um, unfortunately, in Westchester, we haven't gotten the response. People say, well, what did you do? Well, we sent it to every chamber head. We emailed it in PDF form. We emailed it not once, but twice. We sent it to every elected official of every community asking them to speak to their chambers, announce it on TV. We've gone back and we've telephoned each chamber not once, but twice and three times. We've gotten some response. So if you have a business and you'd like to participate, I have some paper programs here. Veterans need go to any of the parks facilities. Here again is where we work together and where we show our county commitment. It's easy to do like other counties and just have them go to the county clerk's office. But in, in reality, that becomes a troublesome and a burden. Uh, we use our park system. Having been a park uh, board representative as the liaison while I served 12 years on the county board, I know full well they give out park passes. So for a very small fee, we were able to buy the program and thousands of cards and we're able to do their programming right there. They come to the, any of the parks facilities that issue ID cards. Uh, they get their favor card. It's a, a simple task. It doesn't take them but a minute. For all year round, um, there are others during season. Your golf courses are open, so anyone can go to a golf course when they open and have their favor card issued. All they have to have is any form of ID. We even made it more simple in that respect. The good point about it is we had about 700 veterans apply. Out of those 700 veterans, we found about 200 that were not, quote unquote, in our system. We had no address information. Some of them were the younger and, uh, veterans returning, and we were able to get about 22 people by making phone calls or emailing them and saying, we notice you're not in this system. Would you like to make an appointment? Uh, I'm happy to say we had those 22 come in, and all of them qualified for VA benefits. Uh, from 30% to 70% because of the injuries they sustained in either Iraq or Afghanistan. So in, 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 in that in itself, I think makes the favor program successful. So thank you very much. I'm sorry. Got the book, <laughs> yeah. And I'm, okay. I'm going to say Thank you. And I know you have a Facebook page up, and I'm sure there's so much more you could tell us. Uh, I apologize that time is short. Uh, you know, for many years, when a vet comes home, maybe one of the best people to talk to is another vet, um, someone who's been through the similar uh, situation, someone who understands. Our local veterans organizations, like the American Legion and the Veterans of Foreign Wars, VFW, are more than just Memorial De Parade Day organizers. They do much more. Uh, we'll find out what they do from our next panelist representing our local veterans organizations. The commander of VFW Post 1156 of Larchmont, Mr. Bert Corwin. 
After graduating from Lehigh University with a degree in mathematics and a commission as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army, Mr. Corwin was deferred from active duty while he completed an MS in statistics at Virginia Tech and a PhD in operation, operations research at Case Western Reserve University. His military service included a posting at the U.S. Army Materiel Command in Washington, D.C., where he was promoted to captain, and then he went to the U.S. Army Engineer Command in Vietnam. Upon leaving military service in 1971, Mr. Corwin taught statistics and quantitative methods at the University of Maryland. Several years later, he joined IBM, where he worked for 33 years as a systems engineer, technical support specialist, and technical support manager. Now retired, Mr. Corwin focuses his attention on two major activities, serving as commander of the local VFW post and teaching part-time in the MBA programs at Fordham University and Iona College. Mr. Corwin has lived in Larchmont since 1984. He and his wife Deirdre have three grown children, all graduates of the Marinette High School. <laughs> his work with returning veterans is to be applauded. Please welcome one of our local hidden heroes, Bert Corwin. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have uh, two, two areas that I want to comment on. First is issues facing returning veterans, and second is a little bit of uh, information about the VFW and the activities of the VFW. The, um, the first thing, uh, when we talk about issues facing returning veterans, um, I want to emphasize the importance to them and to all veterans of being thanked. Basically, um, as a Vietnam veteran, we know, I know, personally, when we returned, we weren't thanked at all. And uh, fortunately, it's taken, it took many, many years, but that's finally changed. The good news is that the returning veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan are much more appreciated and tend to be thanked more. And it's important. If you see, a, I tell kids in the schools, if you see a, you're traveling and you're driving somewhere, you're in an airport, and you see a veteran in fatigues, you know they're on their way home or they're on their way back. Go up to them and thank them for their service. It's, it's very important. As I said, the good news is things are a lot better than they were in Vietnam. Uh, but the bad news is that today, th today the good news, as I said, is the general public is more aware and more grateful to these fellows. The bad news is that the general public is not involved in what's going on now and has been going on since 2003. They haven't paid for it, and they're not participating in it. There's no shared sacrifice. If you think about it, there's 300 million people in this country. There's right now approximately 1.4 million in active duty, and there are about 439,000 who have served one or more tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. So the problem is, it's, ast it's astounding if you think about it. No wonder there's a, uh, so little focus on issues of returning veterans because they're below the consciousness of the majority of people. They're not involved, they're not paying, they've never been taxed for any of these ventures, and they're basically not participating. In Vietnam, there, were, there was participation. You were either threatened to get drafted or you got drafted and your families were in the boat. Now there's so few people in the boat that it's below the level of consciousness. Um, in previous wars, and the other thing uh, I want to talk about now, talking about issues, people think of veterans as a homogeneous group. It is not. It's very, very heterogeneous. You have to think of differentiating them into groups, subgroups. Thing they can differentiate on criteria such as their military occupational specialty. What did they do? Um, the portion of the tour spent in combat. The mental and physical uh, burdens that they may bear. PTSD they may suffer from. What health issues do they have? What is their education and employment background? So you have to basically ask all those questions to determine what kind of veteran you're talking about. Because the needs of each one of those are very, very different. Approximately 32,000, as of last August, 33,000 service members have been wounded in Iraq or Afghanistan. And it's estimated approximately 20% of those <coughs> have serious brain and spinal injuries. So the first order of business in terms of issues facing returning veterans is health care. It's basically for those, those that need it to make sure that the country, starting with the VA, provides them and their families with the care and support that they need. 
The second order of business is jobs and job training. And again, this is not the same for everybody. It's going to be different depending on the group that you're talking about. Uh, this includes encouraging and supporting those who are seeking higher education under the GI Bill. Um, and also looking and encouraging job training programs and job programs like the uh, job fairs that Vito was talking about. Um, but these are very important. The person that I turn to for uh, my information, on especially uh, jobs and job training, is Ron Toshi, who is not here today, but basically is the former um, New York State uh, Chairman of Veter Veterans Affairs, is continually involved in veterans issues and spent a lot of time on this uh, training issue. Now, if we I know the role of the summit is to focus on local issues, and we keep talking about what, what is the applicability local. So trying to translate the needs of veterans in the general category of health care and jobs and training locally, in my opinion, is not feasible nor productive. In preparation for this session, I, I talked to the, I'm a member, not act, I'm a member of the post 347 and also I'm very close, closely connected with post 90 of the American Legion. And I polled them to find out how many Af Iraqi Afghanistan veterans we have in our community. Very, very few. And the other thing is the ones that we do have, for the most part, are not 22-year-old guys who return from being what's called in the military, in the Army parlance, an 11 Bravo, life weapons infantry men. Most of them were basically guys who were reservists. So they had jobs, they had families, they had something to return to. So our community is not uh, reflective, partly because there's not a lot of people out of Mamaroneck High School that are enlisting in the volunteer army. So I think the value of this session is much more an overall awareness and sensitivity to the issues rather than looking for a direct applicability in the large Mamaroneck community. The last thing I want to talk, say a few words about is uh, the, our VFW post. Our VFW post is its focus is on service. We don't have an active bar. We don't have a bunch of guys drinking there every night. It's focused on service. Service to veterans, service to the community. And some of the things that we do for 58 straight consecutive years, we have done a, a Christmas party, a holiday party the first Saturday in December, and a picnic the first Saturday in August. Think about that. For veterans from Montrose Hospital, various groups. 58 straight years. Um, I get, a yes, I, get a, I get emotional about it. We also put our money where our mouth is in terms of, of supporting veterans, uh, veterans issue. In 2010, we contributed uh, almost $9,000 to veterans organizations that we had carefully vetted. Things such as the Fisher House Foundation, Intrepid Fallen Heroes Fund, America's Vet Dog, uh, the National Military Families Association, and the VFW and National Military Services Organization that supports for the phone cards for troops. Um, we conduct a Memorial Day ceremony every year and basically have at Tompkins Park and we have a breakfast following at the Post. In terms of service to the community, we work in partnership with the Town of Mamaroneck. Our facility houses on a long-term basis the uh, Mamaroneck, Larson Mamaroneck Senior Citizen Center. Um, we actively participate in various efforts in the schools to educate kids about service and about the the contributions of veterans to the way of life that they enjoy today. We co-sponsored with the town of Ameriknek a, a service project for an Eagle Scout, uh, Adam Bernstein. We've supported the Kemper Memorial Park Preservation Foundation over the years. We sponsored last year a $2,000 scholarship, two-year scholarship for a senior at Ameriknek High School. This year we'll be sponsoring that scholarship plus another scholarship for Rynek High School. Um, we contributed $500 to one of our members' daughters who basically did a humanitarian relief effort in Haiti. Um, so the bottom line for a uh, small, I get very emotional with this stuff today. For a small veterans organization, we do a hell of a lot. And as the commander of that organization, I speak for the whole group, we're very proud of the things that we do to serve veterans and serve our community. And that's the best thing that we can do to help address the issues of returning veterans. And, uh, and basically by reaching out to those that we can find here. Our, when you look at the complexion of veterans around here, I, I just look at my post. We, I have 
five guys over uh, the active group. I have five guys over 90. It's dominated by World War II, Korea, and tailing off Vietnam. And we have nothing beyond that. And the reason is, with no draft, the volunteer army, there are not people enlisting out of Americanic High School. So, and I think that profile is very, it's, it's certainly true in the state of New York, in the VFW, and it's true also in the, in the legions as well. There's basically just not that many folks, and it's, it's, it's too bad. As one of our elder statesmen says, we got to keep staying here because there will be another war, and then there'll be a bunch of these guys coming back, so we got to be ready for them. But anyway, enough. enough but those are the. Th I think just if you have an appreciation for basically the general issues that these guys are facing, returning, and the sensitivity to it, and then realize that there are some organizations locally that are doing a lot of work, supporting organization can really, really help them. Thank you. Right, that was moving. Um, you know, my next, I had a pre prepared this in advance and I said, what is the face of military service? And it's so interesting that Bert had discussed just that. Um, you know, is, is it one of your neighbors? Is it somebody that you would bump into at religious services or on Restaurant Row on Mamaroneck Avenue? Our final pa panelist is a military veteran with a unique story who you might very well bump into around town. David F. Everett lives in Larchmont with his wife and two children. I don't know if one's in college, three children. Oh my God, I left one out. Three children. <laughs> one's in college. Yeah, yes. one's in college, that's why. Um, and is a practicing attorney whose office is yeah. located in Mamaroneck Village. His law practice includes civil trial and appellate work, personal injury, medical malpractice, construction, labor law, military law, traffic violations, and much more. <laughs> the list was endless. He formerly served as an ADA assistant district attorney in Kings County and in Queens County. But the reason he's here today is that there's a patriotic sparkle in his eye, which comes out when retired, now retired, Colonel David Everett of the U.S. Army Reserve talks about serving his country. He had more than 30 years of experience in the U.S. Army. In 1991, he served in the Persian Gulf. In 2005, he volunteered to be recalled to active duty for Operation Iraqi Freedom. In 2009, he served in Afghanistan in Operation Enduring Freedom and helped improve security and train the Afghan National Police to protect themselves against terrorists. So far, so good? Yes. And I think we're leaving out some other countries like Saudi Arabia. I'd like, yeah. I, let's say he's been around, okay? While stationed at Camp Eggers in Kabul in 2009, he helped arrange weekly conference calls between Jewish soldiers and Rabbi Mendel Silverstein, director of the Chabad uh, Lubavitch of Larchmont, Marinette. This enabled soldiers in the combat zone to have a connection with their faith. And now, <laughs> without further ado, please give a warm welcome to a true patriot and another local hidden hero, Colonel, he hates me, one of them, David Harris. You have been very successful and embarrassing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and, and, and everybody here is a patriot. I just want to want to make that point. Um, I'm gonna. I, I'm looking at the clock, and I know we probably want to have some questions here, so I'm gonna abbreviate my remarks. Um, you heard a little bit about my background. I just want to uh, go back uh, to something uh, that was said uh, a few moments ago about the treatment of the Vietnam veterans, which was truly shameful. Uh, it was horrible, and it's only now, in, in recent years, that that's been been turned around, and, and I think apologies have been made, although a little bit too late. Um, a group, when I returned from, from Iraq, we had a local group of Vietnam Veterans of America who came and welcomed the group that I was coming back with, and it was part of an ongoing thing that this particular post in New Jersey was doing, and their motto was something to the effect that never will we allow another group of veterans to be treated the way we were treated, and so it was, it was really nice to get that kind of reception. And although certain things have changed uh, uh, about the reception of, of veterans, uh, unfortunately, most returning veterans are under the radar. Most they're, they're just not observable by most of us. And uh, you know, you just have to look at, 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 at the popular culture. I mean, when I returned from, from Iraq, 
uh, you know, having, having seen some pretty terrible things. Uh, the big news headline was that Anna Nicole Smith had died of an overdose. And I'm thinking, you know, this, this is like news. I mean, we have American young men, young American men and women being killed over in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and somebody who was like, never made any contribution to society whatsoever is being celebrated in her death, you know, at, at her own hands. So, you know, it, it, it's very unfortunate that popular culture is that way, rather than welcoming and, and, and celebrating the, the return of, of veterans. The experiences of, of veterans, needless to say, uh, uh, post-deployment are very different. You go through a lot of different things. Uh, you know, I was fortunate. I was not in, in heavy combat or anything like that, but a large number of the people who come back from Iraq and Afghanistan were. And, you know, just, just to give you an, an example, you know, being, being in a combat zone really does make you look at life in, in, in a very different light. Uh, my unit, uh, we spent, when I was in Iraq, we spent five days a week in, in the red zone in a, at a forward operating base, and then we came back for two days of meetings in the green zone. And each time we made the convoy to or from, we would, uh, we would be in, uh, in, in armored vehicles and uh, Humvees, as you've seen on television and such. And each time we would make that move, we'd receive a briefing from the platoon sergeant or the lieutenant in charge of the convoy uh, before the convoy would depart. And that briefing included the line, should the convoy be effectively stopped and decisively engaged, be prepared to locate, close with, and destroy the enemy by fire and maneuver. And that's not something you typically hear the conductor announce on the 726 the Grand Central. <laughs> so, so, you know, it, it, it's just a, a, a totally different uh, uh, mindset. And, and, and in many instances, and this was told to me by, by a Vietnam veteran who I was serving with there who was a, a contract, he said, you don't realize the, won't realize the effect that this is all having on you until you get home and you realize the intensity of the situation. I can tell stories about this you know, later on. But you don't realize the intensity of the situation you're in uh, because you've acclimated to it until you get home and, and, and it really uh, it, it is, it is it, 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 it's very, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, 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 it's, it can be very disconcerting when you come home and, and, and you have that, that difference. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the transition that one makes. You know, in, in the military, uh, there's a sense of camaraderie that you just, especially in armed conflict, that's just not found in many other places. Uh, there really is a sense of being a, a band of brothers and sisters. And it's an unspoken thing generally, but you know that if you're ever in trouble, your guys are coming in after you. It, 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 no matter what the risk, it's just an unwritten thing. And you know likewise that you're going to do the same for them. And there are very few situations, you know, in civilian society where you can really say that's true. And so when, when one re-enters the civilian sector from the military, that's just one of the other things that, that, is, that takes a little getting used to, especially when people return to a community where there are not a lot of military veterans. So for example, if somebody's returning with the unit and they're going back to Fort Benning or Fort Bragg or Camp Lejeune or something like that, they are with a group of people that can relate to their experience. When you go back into the civilian sector in some place other than that, it is a much more difficult transition, especially for a younger person who's, you know, doesn't have the same level of maturity that, 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 that an old guy like me, I hope that uh, has. Okay. I'm just going just gonna to make a, a, a few more comments and then I'll wrap this up so we can have questions. You know, it, I, I can honestly say that it was, was uh, an honor to have served with the uh, many of the fine people in, in our armed forces. And I say this in particular about the, the young men and women who make up the majority of our forces. And if you look at in the New York Times, they publish the names of the dead. Look at the ages of most of those kids who are getting killed, 21, 19, 23. It's very skewed on the younger side. Now, you know, the reality is we live in an area where some people look down on those who would join the military, an area where few of our kids Few of the kids that we know have to join the, uh, the military in order to find money for college. Uh, and, 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 and the fact is that I've had situations with them, people didn't, weren't aware of my background or didn't know I, I was listening, where they actually would denigrate the desire of a son or a daughter <coughs> to join the military, even though the reasons were noble for patriotic reasons. Um, George Orwell said, we sleep safe in our beds because rough men stand ready in the night to visit violence on those who would do us harm. And the fact is that most of these rough men, as uh, Orwell referred to them, are rough only because of what they're asked to do in the name of all of us. 
Many are kids right out of high school who believe it's their duty to serve their country. And yet when we turn on the radio in the morning and hear that two soldiers were killed at a, a checkpoint in Baghdad or three Marines were killed fighting in Helmand province in Afghanistan, how many of us even put down our toothbrushes to think about this sacrifice and the loss to their loved ones? How many of us even bother to read the names of the dead listed in the New York Times to find out how old they were, where they came from, anything about them? So the reality is that as Americans, these young men and women are our sons and daughters, our brothers and sisters. I ask that you remember both the dead and the living in your thoughts and prayers throughout the coming year. But I also very much appreciate, I think we all do, the interest and support that all of you have indicated uh, for the veterans, for the returning veterans by your presence here and your interest in the uh, veterans' issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd just like to, you know, this is so touching, I have to say. I just want to take one second to um, recognize someone who came in late. Um, I apologize that I, I'm drawing attention to the fact that you, you snuck in. Um, Congresswoman Nita Lowy's district director um, for Veterans Affairs, uh, and it's Joseph Donat. Yes, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, you know, I know we're uh, crunch for time here, but I just want to take a moment to uh, thank our panelists again. You know, some Jerry may be a uh, community leader, but he's also, uh, you know, nationally recognized by Secretary Shinseki year after year for his efforts uh, providing uh, crucial health care uh, services to our veterans. And, and Vito, uh, Vito and I work very closely. Um, you know, whereas Vito on the county level was able to help uh, veterans. Uh, actually fill out their claims with the VA, we're able to uh, in turn inquire with the VA and um, oftentimes uh, have those benefits uh, expedited. And Mr. Corwin, uh, you know, his, his post serves as a uh, you know, role model for posts uh, nationally. Um, and just last evening, you know, stemming from what uh, Mr. Corwin said about thanking our veterans, a good friend of mine that I uh, grew up with, uh, one of my good friends, uh, gave me a ring last night um, and I had the opportunity to thank him uh, pre-deployment. He'll be uh, deployed uh, in the next coming months to Afghanistan. So that's, you know, uh, certainly something that, you know, is appreciated by all veterans and service members. And Mr. Everett, uh, <laughs> he not only helps our returning <coughs> service members, he also helps uh, our, our, our young men and women that are interested in joining the military. He has uh, served on Congresswoman Lowy's uh, Service Academy Review Board for a number of years and was uh, just recently this year uh, named chair of the review board. And uh, he, uh, I've had the opportunity to work closely with him for uh, a number of years now. Um, as for the local issues facing our veterans, you know, I, I really see it as, as sort of twofold. There's, I think we all share in a desire to try and help our veterans uh, and service members, both uh, recently returning members and then also some of our, uh, you know, older veterans. Um, as for the jobs, you know, I share in Vito and the rest of this board's desire to try and get them out there. But like Mr. Robert said, some of our service members unfortunately fly under the radar upon return from their deployment. So our efforts both, you know, are helping the most recently returning veterans, but also as I began with discussing my, my interaction with uh, Mr. Pinto's office, also helping some of our older veterans receive uh, the claims and, and benefits that they rightfully uh, deserve. So, you know, uh, with that, I will uh, leave it up for the rest of the questions, but if anyone would like to speak with me afterwards, I'd be uh, happy to talk further with you. Thank you. How the healthcare and the VA reflects on the overall problem of healthcare in the country today. There are two important, very contentious issues and relate right back to the today. First, is the question of the cost of health care and the quality of health care goes right back to the VA because of the big issue, which we can spend a morning here some time, on how doctors should be remunerated. And the three main categories that we will present are, are fee for service, group care and salary doctors. The VA has solved the problem of quality and cost by choosing doctors who work on salary. And despite the objections <coughs> of most doctors in the country and many other groups, 
the relationship between doctor and patient as to remuneration when the doctor's salary works very, very well and the, and the VA proves it. The second big issue is very contentious, politically uh, uh, quagmire, is uh, medical malpractice. The VA has solved that problem. And a lot of people don't pay attention to it because they have a system whereby what, if there is an error in the practice of medicine and they're bound to occur, this is immediately confessed to the patient and the family. We find that when the patient does that in all kinds of practice, when the doctor does that in all kinds of practice, there's no soup follows. Medical malpractice is a big contention between Republicans and Democrats. And you see it in the newspapers every other day. And the healthcare in the VA has solved that problem as well. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Um, um, we're in a psychiatric hospital. And um, I was wondering what your thoughts are. I think we all agree that the current veterans, the younger generation, you made those points so well, too, why they don't come for help. Uh, they have lots of good reasons why they don't come for help. But the truth is, we've treated quite a few of the children and the wives and husbands of veterans, current veterans, and there's no question <clears throat> that they do need to, to get help. And I was wondering if there was any way, or had you thought through any ways of encouraging them to come for help. Possibly, um, you know, there are blind records that could be, done. we've done that before at hospitals where we haven't used their names and kept their privacy, things like that, that might encourage them to come. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about how we could encourage them to come for help, because suicide rate is high and lots of problems. The, the incidence of mental health issues within our returning pets Substance abuse, um, suicidality is is very high, uh, and we, we know that. Uh, the there are a couple of things that the VA has done to to try to encourage uh, the young men and women to come in. The first thing is that we have entities out there which are called vet centers. We have a vet center in White Plains. We have a vet center in Middletown, up in Orange County. Uh, the vet centers are part of us. We, I, they, they belong to me at, at the VA, <laughs> but they're a, an unrecorded clinical intervention. Uh, they, they're, they don't generate a medical record. Uh, it doesn't go into the VA's record, and so it's a, a kind of an open book. It's run entirely by veterans, so every counselor has to be a veteran. Um, and so it's an entry point. And it was actually established after Vietnam uh, because the Vietnam vets had such a distrust for anything that had to do with the government that the vet center was created as this very separate entity. Uh, and they work. And, and so a lot of young men and women are entering into the VA through the vet center. They get, they get that trust level up, then they realize they need more and they'll enter into the VA. But it, it transcends that so that we have that, op that operation there. It, it transcends that because the, the veterans just don't see the need. We, we, we have a, um, we talk about encouragement. We started a program about a year ago. We actually, it's an award-winning program for the, for the nation where we have, I should have brought some with me. We have a little business card, yeah. card size card. And what we've done is we've educated first responders throughout the Hudson Valley. And what we're finding is a, a way to catch up with these young men and women who need help is through our police and ambulance folks because they tend to get in trouble here and there. They get pulled over a lot. They drive at uh, accelerated speeds because of their experiences in, in, in country. And a lot of police officers don't want to take a veteran in. They don't want to arrest them. They don't want to do what they have to do. So we've armed the police officers throughout the Hudson Valley with these cards which says, you may need some help. And here's a number to call. And we have found tremendous amount of young men and women coming in for services just through that card. Interestingly enough, a lot of police officers who are veterans too have, have used that card. Um, but what I would say to you is any ideas that you have about 
getting into the community and, and engaging those young men and women, especially as a, a mental health leader in the community, I'm all ears. So I'd be happy to talk with anybody who has a good idea. And just getting out and talking to all of you folks, moms, girlfriends, <coughs> wives, sisters, I hate to put it on the ladies, but they're the ones that, that drag the veteran into the VA. Yes. I have a question relating to the education system. Um, I know that I've heard that the benefits for um, these vets is really pretty good, almost comparable to the ones uh, after the Second World War right. that were given. And I'm, I've also been informed that if they aren't being used as widely as they had hoped. And I was wondering what kind of effort is being made on both sides, both by the military services and by local colleges to reach out to those people and those who do seek those services, what sort of oversight is provided? Because many of these kids really need um, an ongoing place to go while they are a student to um, monitor them uh, on that path. I mentioned earlier there are four schools basically very federal, federal friendly. Each of the schools has a counselor. Uh, most of them are, I think in every case, they're veterans themselves. Sure. Our, the our education counselors okay. at the schools. So when a veteran busters out, uh, the DOD policy is to let them know what their benefits are, where they can go for uh, uh, filing of claims. Uh, but it's very minimal with that respect. Most guys and ladies just want to get out and, as was mentioned earlier, go home and try to find their way back into society. Those who went in as reservists or guards people, as was mentioned, have a place to go. They usually have a job, but they do take advantage of their educational benefits. Um, I just spoke down at uh, Monroe College the other night. We had a Veterans uh, Appreciation Evening for the students. Um, they have over 200 veterans in their two campuses who are, uh, uh, you know, obtaining a degree. Uh, Mercy College has been uh, renowned for its veteran-friendly uh, educational programs, as is Fordham. Uh, Mike Gillen, Dr. Gillen, uh, who's a resident of, uh, of Eastchester and whose wife with who was with whom I worked was his wife, um, they're very friendly towards veterans. They go out and they'll do outreach, they'll help sponsor things. But uh, I also want you to understand that not every person who serves, mm -hmm. as was mentioned, the young people who are going in, um, just the rifle total, uh, the plane pusher, uh, they, they, they had a struggle to get a GED. So we're looking at other benefits like the community college and career placement, but benefits are there. They've been extended, they've been lengthened, the amount of money they get has been substantial in terms of being able to go on with a life and reside and pay for their costs. So we're getting that done. And I think that's the one area that we picked up a few just at our Veterans Town meetings over the last couple of years. Uh, since I, uh, prior to my even taking over this office, people find out about it. We always have students uh, represented, and once they do that, we're reaching out. That's the one benefit I think we should all uh, be proud of. Just a comment on that. The uh, Ron Tochi happened to be at our VFW meeting last night, and this kind of came up. There are, as Vito says, there's some people that college is not the right, is not the right track. Um, those people need training programs and job opportunities. And they, they, there seems to be a very fragmented response to that. Uh, he expressed a lot of frustration as basically the former chairman of Veterans Affairs of New York State and the Department of Labor and the things that they're able to do and not do. The bottom line, according to Ron, is basically the government needs to get involved by sponsoring, giving, giving sponsorship money to firms to basically build training programs and provide job opportunities, and that is that is apparent. That is very fragmented. So you have a whole segment that are not, you know, they're not going to community college. That's not the right track for them. The other thing I just a separate note I wanted to note as a personally. I believe it was somebody from Vito's office, or maybe Vito himself, a number of years ago came to our VFW and talked about benefits. And a whole bunch of us, in, were, I had no enrollment in the VA, none. And so I enrolled, a number of others enrolled, and it's been a very positive experience. The White Plains Clinic has been a positive experience. They get medication to the VA. So for me personally and some of our other members, it's been very, very good. The other thing is, People will call the VFW thinking like it's an answering service and we know everything about everything about the military. 
and I just tell them, oh, we know. <laughs> and it's, um, it's, it's, it's been very successful. I think the, uh, that, that having that capability for Westchester County is very, very good. A place for people to turn to. There are, the veterans organizations themselves have service officers. Um, but they probably, and they're located at, like, at the uh, VA centers, like the one in Manhattan. There, you go on one floor of that, and there's basically service officers for the VFW, for the American Legion, for the Purple Heart Society, for the Vietnam veterans, and so on. But to have something right in the county here is a starting point for people when they have questions about eligibility, whether they're young or they're old, it's, it's, a, it's very good. Okay, uh, I want to be sensitive to the time. Uh, maybe we'll take uh, one or two more questions, and then we're gonna. You can speak with our uh, speakers individually afterwards. You have a question? Uh, good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank our panel. Very distinguished, and uh, Percy connected to two gentlemen up there. Um, my question in regard to the distinction, and maybe you can, anyone you can answer this. We have uh, the enlisted that uh, the enlisted uh, person. And then we have the people who are considered National Guardsmen and who are registered in, in our National Guards and Service. Is it true, as I, as, I, as I heard it, that there are now more National Guardsmen serving than there are enlisted individuals? And what is the distinction in terms of the benefits between a National Guardsman and an enlisted service person? Uh, is there a di distinction? Like, I, I was told that sometimes National Guardsmen don't have the full benefits of an enlisted uh, en enrolled uh, individual. If, if an Can you just correct me. If a guard or reservist Regard is, is, is activated and becomes active duty military, goes to Iraq, Afghanistan, they, they are, when they are discharged, they become a veteran, they're eligible for anything that any active duty Entitled veteran Entitled to full service. Would, would be. Right. Thank you. No. No. There used to be a time limit where you had to serve at least a full year on duty. With, Could with, you speak loud? With Guard and Reserve, as soon as they're called up, their families are eligible for what they call CHAMP VA, which is a U.S. medical uh, health program as well to supplement if they don't have, or even if they do have a health insurance, then <coughs> one benefit is paid, then the difference is paid through CHAMP VA. But they, they, they are eligible for full benefits when they return. Thank you. Darren, did you have anyone? Yeah, actually, I just want to add to that, that uh, if they're called into active duty by the president, if the government calls the National Guard uh, active activated for something that's within the state or something like that, they would not be allowed. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. So, so they have to be activated by the president. <coughs> All right, one more question, and then we're, uh, any others? No? Okay, just, I just, I would just like to especially thank this panel. I, as a, um, sister of a Vietnam vet who was not only not spoken to when he came back having flown for a year over there, um, the, the kind of feeling that went for years, he's finally able to talk to his sons and get out a few of the things, the mementos, and things are coming full circle. And I think some of the wonderful work that's being done in that regard, I'm sorry the doctor's gone. I was glad to hear that comment about the medical things that the VA is way ahead of the others on. But I'm so grateful for that 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 general group. I'd like to mention that it's it's Jim Lehrer's program, uh, NPR, PBS, getting a lot of trouble these days. That does have veterans every time they get a group. They will list those names and show those pictures. That's one of the most important ways to keep it up. But above all, I want to thank you all and Caroline. I think you all have done a great job. All right, I just want to make one housekeeping comment, which is the envelope is going around. If you haven't put your $7 in, please do it. And uh, I want to thank all of you for coming, and a very warm thank you to our panel, our distinguished panel, who has moved me to tears and enlightened me. about the office and about the favorite problem.